Hello again. How's everyone doing? Feeling good? Pumped? Fired up? Yeah, I feel the energy. It's awesome. <laughs> so I am uh, pleased to introduce Sham, who will be giving a great talk on a really important topic, which is uh, hiring security. So please give a warm 1700 hour welcome to Sham. <laughs> Cool, so a brief introduction about myself. Uh, I'm the head of product and application security at Coinbase. Uh, in terms of ownership, we've got everything from user security, like user facing products, to crypto nodes, and then hardware and up. Uh, it's kind of our purview. So uh, also for this talk, um, this is a brief case study in terms of how we built our hiring pipeline, why we hire as we hire, and kind of who, who we look for. Um, again, there are a lot of caveats here. Uh, first is these are, there are a lot of opinions on how to hire well and what you should look for when you're building a program. Uh, these are my opinions on what I look for and what I think are important. These aren't the only opinions. You're welcome. I encourage you to tell me that I'm wrong. Uh, second, uh, I'm using Coinbase as a case study here. So I'm trying to avoid this sounding like a sales pitch as much as I can, but I'm going to reference kind of what we do, what we are, what's going on a lot in order to kind of get that information across. Uh, last, there's a lot of simplification that's going to be happening here. Um, there's many months and years of work that went into getting to where we are right now. Uh, a lot of that I have to sum up in a slide. So I'm going to be glossing over some stuff. It'll be maybe not that obvious. So first off, like any good case study, let's start with the problem statement. Uh, Coinbase at its core has uh, four assets that we really, really care about. Uh, first is cryptocurrency, and we have a lot of it that can be irrevocably lost. Uh, second is user data. In order to operate in the US, you know, we have to collect a lot of user data, and we have to keep it for a long time. Uh, it's probably one of our largest liabilities. Uh, the third is actual user trust, that we'll keep the first two items safe and secure. And finally, it's an agile en engineering team that heartily embraces uh, near continuous dis uh, delivery. With those four problems uh, kind of established and kind of the, the assets that we have to protect, we've got two basic goals. Uh, keep those assets, keep the engineers moving fast. Um, I really have nothing else to add here. Like, this is about as simple as it can get in terms of summing it all up. There's a lot when it comes to actual operations to enable these, but at the end of the day, that's, that's all it is. So what do we decide to do? Uh, there's three basic things that we did. First, we want to integrate with sprint planning, sprint retros, kind of how our dev teams work. So that's be present when the work is getting done so we understand how it gets done, know kind of what, how the sausage is made. Uh, the second is work in the pipelines themselves. The devs have set up CI, CD, they have automated testing, they have code reviews for every pull request. Uh, add into those pipelines and processes all the stuff that we want to get done. If they're doing automated testing, build security tooling that sits right next to it. If they're doing code reviews anyway, make sure they know when and how to tag security people into those code reviews. Uh, and finally, if they're, you know, they're using feature flags and whatnot to ship fast, get security teams opted into those feature flags. Make sure that we're part of the test cohorts. Uh, the last thing that we really wanted to do was not be a security team that only finds bugs, but also like, starts to fix them. Uh, we, we think that there's no point if all you can do is kind of raise the flag. We need people who are at least capable of patching small issues. Maybe not the big, gnarly, deep ones, but at least superficial ones. Uh, essentially, let's not be dependent on another team in order to get our work done. So with that, how do you establish kind of who you're looking for? Uh, there's a neat little trick that just happened, which is as I described all the different pieces of what we're looking for, we've kind of written up a job description. Uh, it'll take a little bit of massaging to make HR and talent like actually happy before you can straight up publish that, but it's kind of four core things, three of which are most important right now. Person needs to be able to code review. They need to be able to write security tooling that's right in our DevOps pipeline. Uh, they need to write, do enough security engineering to be able to fix and like, prevent core security bugs in code. Uh, we also would love some, some architecture reviews and threat modeling, but if you can do the first three, you can solve most of the problems. So with that, let's start talking about the actual kind of hiring process. This is the meat of uh, what we do and why we do it. 
So again, uh, before we get too deep into that, let's figure out what we want to optimize for. Uh, we chose a couple core aspects. First, we want to minimize the number of hops we send a person through. Uh, it's super painful being in a hiring pipeline, right? There's lots of people to talk to. You're constantly being judged. It's no fun. We want that information and that process to be kind of as clear and as efficient as possible at every step. Uh, because of that, we also want to get as much like kind of signal as we can out of each hop. Um, while not adding a ton of cost to doing each hop, whether that's the cost on the person who's giving kind of being interviewed or the interviewer on the other side. Uh, end of the day, we ended up with three hops and about nine total hours of work. Uh, of course, it's not nine hours from start to finish. It'll still take you know, a, couple, a couple weeks to get through. Uh, the fastest we've seen this kind of go through is about a week and a half. Uh, so starting off, there's two phone calls. Uh, the first phone call is with our recruiting team. Uh, it covers the basics. Uh, are you employable in the US or wherever else we're trying to hire you? Uh, do you actually understand what the job is and do you want this job? Um, do you, you know, are there any other kind of vagaries or things we need to understand about how you do work that makes you like not necessarily want to work with us? Also, do you care enough about Coinbase to actually work here? Uh, again, the stress of having to protect billions of crypto is enough that you, know, you need to self-select in, and it's easy to select out, and we want you to make that decision as soon as possible. There's a second uh, phone call, and that's with the, the lead. That call is not any kind of screening. Um, that's mostly to answer questions for the candidate. Uh, what do you want to know about the program? What do you want to know about how the team works? What, do you want to, like, what questions can we answer? Is there work from home? So on and so forth. Uh, we found that there wasn't a ton of signal in actually asking kind of probing questions, getting information, or trying to judge a candidate at this point over the phone. Nobody really knows them. You have a resume to work off of and nothing really else. So with that, this is generally a very quick pass through. There's very few candidates that actually stop at this point. Uh, here's where we do most of the work. We provide a code sample that we asked our de these developers and these security engineers to take a look at. We look for three core things. Please find the issues. Please prioritize the issues. Please fix the highest priority issue. If you go back to what we said we wanted to enable our team with in the earlier slides, there were three things that we wanted people to do. Right? We wanted them to be in code reviews finding bugs. We wanted them to be able to fix their own bugs. And we wanted them to kind of work with these dev teams, understand how those pipelines and processes work, know how to prioritize, get stuff in the right place. This gives us kind of the most signal as far as the technical implementation of the job as we can possibly get, right? We're, we're using this as the make or break for 90% of candidates. Um, one thing that we did to kind of balance out how important this is, is we made a very robust internal rubric for how to grade this which means every single vulnerability that we found or has been found or we know about has its, its, kind of its score, what the vulnerability is, and what an expected fix looks like. Um, we did this for two main reasons. One, we found that we weren't being consistent in scoring across candidates. And given how important we made this, that, that, was, not, uh, that was a non-starter. We had to be better at that. Uh, second is we needed to reduce bias, right? Like, Part of inconsistency is some candidates are, getting, are being selected out because they didn't write the report the right way or they fixed a bug that somebody else didn't necessarily think was high priority. We decided for our team, these are high priority bugs. This is what it looks like. Everybody, like, we agree with this rubric so everybody can kind of grade the same way. For a candidate, this is about four hours for, for them to get through. It's about 250 lines of code. It's Sinatra. Um, it's not very hard to look at, but still, we, there's about, uh, I don't know, 50-ish bugs that you could find if you start looking for them. Um, when it comes to grading, it takes us about 30 minutes to get through uh, a report. Uh, worst case is about an hour, like an hour where somebody fixed about 15 of the bugs that they found instead of just the first one. Uh, what do we look for in this rubric, right? They're scoring. Did you find enough critical bugs that you can, we trust you to find critical bugs? Uh, did you actually fix the bug right? Right. There's no point if you didn't fix the bug properly, you have to fix it correctly. Uh, and also, did you write it up well enough that a dev, team, a dev team could kind of consume it and understand it, right? Is your prioritization there? Is that report good? This is, however, the only gate until they actually get to the, uh, the in-person review. In-person is much more lightweight. All we're looking for at this point is uh, 
given that you've you know, shown competency in the technical part, can you actually get along with people and do you understand it? Uh, for those of us who've been do doing security for a while, this is probably the hardest part of the job that isn't actually finding the bugs. It's convincing everybody else to fix them. It's being able to communicate about them. It's being able to work with people kind of in person and get through it. Uh, and again, this is where we lean this interview towards. We've, we're comfortable with your tech competency up in this point, right? The take home has established it. Uh, we just want to know how well do you do with people? So we break that out into three main interviews. Uh, the first one is like a pair programming. We've asked you to fix a bug that's usually like the one critical bug takes about a line to fix in the code sample. In this case, it's a couple more lines of code. Can you do simple enough integration work that you could build enough tools that work in our dev pipeline? Right? Like we need people who can automate against curls. We need people who can write unit tests and so forth. This only tests up to that point. Um, we're not looking for esoteric kind of competencies in weird algorithms. We just want to know, can you get stuff done? Uh, again, this is a pair programming that's led by a developer on our team, not necessarily somebody on the security or the AppSec team. Uh, we want to know, can you work with like a dev and can you guys sit together and get some stuff done? Uh, again, the answer we're looking for is enough code to write a simple task and work with a developer. The second kind of major part is an hour long session that we have. Uh, it's a whiteboarding session. We'll put, we'll have a developer, like an actual developer on our team, put together kind of a, a rough sketch of an idea that they want to do. Um, initially, that's all it was. We have, however, kind of gotten rubrics there as well. We realized that developers, A, didn't really know what they, what, where to go with one of these questions once they started asking and they got stuck. And B, we started getting bias again in terms of poor questions being added. So again, rubric everything. Uh, but here it's kind of how we actually do work. A uh, developer will shoulder tap you, You'll, they'll sit for half an hour to an hour and whiteboard something out. Um, we realized what we, what we wanted was somebody who could go back and forth with the developer, get an understanding of kind of what are they building, how are they building it, where security controls need to be. Um, but we also wanted a security person in that room to actually judge the quality of the interview. Uh, the developers were judging against kind of the wrong thing when it came to, came to output here. They were saying, hey, is this person friendly or good to talk with? Uh, I also want to know, can they find critical controls that need to be implemented? Do they understand where problems are going to come up? Um, again, we're, we're looking for two things. One is, can you find those core security concerns early? And second is, can you work with the dev while they're still just like at the whiteboard stage? Uh, what, what we want to do is by moving kind of to the left, it's you're not going to have documents. You're not going to have like large architecture diagrams or whatnot. You're just going to have people with ideas who want to do stuff. Let's figure out how to help them do that securely. The finals, what I'm going to say is our softest interview question. And this is probably, again, it's more fraught with bias and we don't have a good solution for how to reduce bias here. Uh, what we're looking to see is how well can this person work with an eng manager on a different team? Right. Again, like as an AppSec person, a ProdSec person, you're going to be embedded with or working with all these different developer, developer teams that are doing different things. Uh, how well do you, can you handle the conflict that arises when a dev team is pushing to ship features and you're pushing to make features more secure? Um, this is, you know, like can you handle the socio-political aspects of the job, right? Can you have those tough conversations, but, you know, relevant, but to your work? Uh, again, we see very mixed kind of results here, and a lot of this, unfortunately, is due to interviewer training and kind of interviewer experience. If you're not good at giving behavioral questions and doing behavioral interviews, uh, this, this section is really hard to run well. So, a uh, quick summary as to where we are so far. Uh, it's about an hour on the phone, just to, are you interested? Do you get the job? Are there questions we can answer about the job? Uh, it's three to four hours on a take home, again, async. It's, this is how you'll do most of your work, right? There's code that's sitting there, stuff that needs to be built. Let's make sure that it's secure, that you've done it, and you can present that information back. Um, again, 30 minutes on our site to actually review it, make sure you've done it right. Then three to four hours in person, covering all the stuff that actually has to do with you being a person doing a job that has other people on the other side. Um, with that said, there's a set of failure cases that I'm worried about and I've brought o over and over again and the biggest one here, it's bias, right? What does bias cause? What does it do? It's you exclude good candidates. Um, you also fail good candidates in your pipeline when you shouldn't have done so. 
Um, how do we introduce it even accidentally into the cycle? It's the activities that you choose and how you choose to grade against them. So even in our case, like we've acknowledged that by asking candidates to do take homes, we're cutting out a whole swath of candidates that otherwise would apply. Um, that hurts us, but we don't have a good way of replicating some of this. Uh, we have ideas around reducing this requirement for people who come in as, um, as referrals or we've worked with before. But again, that's like going to be the exceptional case. It's not going to be the generic case. Uh, we also lose candidates to interviewers who don't know how to interview their parts. Right? If you don't know how to run this behavioral, if you're doing this pair programming and you're not looking for just base level code competency, you're actually asking for much more esoteric or harder problems, like we're going to lose candidates because our interviewers are doing poor jobs. Um, but there are paths to success here. Right? These are fixable or mitigatable for the most part. Again, we can have more paths to success for where we want more data. You know, can you do the core job? Uh, we want more activities people can choose from. Like, there's going to be people who can't do the take home. What's the next best thing we can offer? Uh, again, those grading rubrics that we've set up and having very kind of formalized, here's the definition of the interview, is all about reducing some of that bias as well. And finally, it's, you sometimes have to rotate your interviewers. Right? If you have the same people talking over and over again, and they are asking and falling into the same traps, right, you're going to have to, A, be there to know that they're making these mistakes and B, actually rotate people in and out so you get fresh sets of eyes. So there's a core principle going all the way back to the beginning is your program, who you hire, why you hire, it's all down to the people. Um, at the end of the day, as much as you know, companies like to abstract out people using like metrics and goals and mission and so forth, like levels, um, nothing's going to make as much of an impact as who you hire. Um, and we're going to break down who you hire into two key pieces. What is your problem? And how are you going to get the right people to solve that problem? Uh, we made the summation here very quickly in terms of what Coinbase's problem is. We have lots of crypto. Crypto, we lose irrevocably. We need to make sure like, code doesn't get out that lets us lose crypto very quickly. Same with user data, same with user trust. Uh, with that, we needed people who could work with dev teams early work with code before it was deployed and be able to you know add to our build pipelines and fix pipelines to make sure that again bad code wasn't getting shipped um, but again it's these people that we like aim to hire and like that we have hired their knowledge their skills and their hard work that actually makes things happen so um Quick, quick outro here. It's if you agree with me, if you disagree with me, if you want to hit me up, if you have any questions about kind of why we chose our pipeline, if you're working on your own pipeline and you want feedback in terms of how to make it better or how to change it, problems that we may have seen, uh, hit me up on my email. I don't really use social media. Um, I, don't, I don't like it. It's very biased. Uh, again, thank you all. has a pretty high bar. Uh, do you hire entry-level people at all? Yeah, so the way we modulate some of this, and I had to gloss over it for this interview, is you take the different aspects of the job um, and you determine kind of how important they are and how difficult they are. So when we first did some of the problem discovery here at Coinbase, we were like, hey, this, this is a Rails code base that's been around since 2011. Uh, we really need like, competent Rails devs. Uh, that, needs, that requires more seniority. Um, as that kind of starts to go down in terms of we've fixed it up or we have fewer bugs that we see coming in, we can modulate kind of how good a candidate needs to be in that particular category of work. Uh, one thing that we haven't found a solution for was that cross-team collaboration bit. Um, at that point, like, even our definition of like level one entry level uh, has way higher cross-team collaboration and kind of socio and empathetic requirements than any other team on the company. Uh, overall, we're at 27. Um, application product security is seven plus a couple contractors. Uh, how many how many candidates do you reject at that third stage, and which is the which is the bucket of the three that typically rejects them? Yeah, um, I'll answer the second question first. Uh, 
Most drop-off we see is people going from phone call to not doing the take-home. Uh, the next drop-off is after the take-home. Um, rejections after the in-person interview is probably 10% to 20%. Uh, we see enough drop off in the earlier pieces that uh, most people who make it that far, uh, and they're, they're generally have been reasonable people because they've had jobs in the past, uh, will pass at that point. Uh, was there a period of time uh, when you were hiring people before you did like, the take home exam? Uh, I assume there was there's got to be a reason to lead up to doing that. How, how bad was that compared to after working? Yeah, so what we found was it wasn't necessarily bad as the like written job description and people self-selecting wasn't nearly as good. And so by making the take home, we actually ended up making our job description better, which then reduced the need for our take home. It also kind of trained our recruiters in terms of what we were looking for, which also reduced the need of take home. So it's kind of like we made ourselves do this work and then we had it in place, then we started using it, but we didn't need it as much. Like going through all the technical questions and stuff in the interview, we run out of time. So we're either you know, sometimes settling or sometimes we keep looking for a unicorn and we find it. Yeah. It's going to happen as well. Like your interviewers will make mistakes at some point. They will just ask technical questions when really they want to know how well are you interacting here. Um, we, you, you can't get away from that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, do you find more success with people in security who are generalists or specialists? Like, for example, someone who knows like five different languages um, decently, or like one or two that are, know them very well. I'm going to say it really depends on the problem scope. Uh, part of what we defined here is we wanted people who could work at the level our developers are working and with them. Um, that implied we needed somebody who was really good at Rails in particular. Right, uh, we deprioritize their need for kind of threat modeling and architecture review. That only comes way later in the life cycle. And the whole reason we did that is because this is like a roughly, a relatively baked application. It's big. Uh, it's there's lots of pieces to it, but it's not changing architecturally a lot. So we didn't need somebody who had seen a lot of problems or seen a lot of things. They just really knew Rails pretty well. Uh, I'm being asked to do this. All right. uh, let's chat after. Oh, uh, as we want to take, we tell them it, the, they should aim for three to four hours, but we don't actually time it. Uh, <laughs> All right, thank you all.